As explained in my previous video, the meaning of sufficient section of the public differs depending on the category of charitable purpose from section 3 subsection 1 of the Charities Act in question. Now, the usual rule, which was the topic of that previous video, applies to all categories of charitable purposes, apart from purposes which, one, prevent or relieve poverty, or two, advance education. So in this video, we're going to turn to the different rule that applies in respect of purposes aimed at preventing or relieving poverty and those aimed at advancing education. So let's get into it. First of all, poverty. So where the purpose in question is for the prevention or relief of poverty, the opportunity to benefit can be unreasonably restricted in any way and still extend to a sufficient section of the public and still satisfy the public aspect of the public benefit test, including to the members of a particular family. So if your purpose is for the prevention or relief of poverty, then the opportunity to benefit can be restricted to the members of a particular family, as in this case here of Reese Scarisbrick. In other words, a trust can be established for the purpose of relieving poverty amongst the settler's relatives. This would not be permitted under the usual rule, a restriction to a family member or to family members under the usual rule would be held unreasonable. Secondly, to the employees of a particular employer. So the opportunity, opportunity to benefit can also be extended to the employees of a particular employer. So the question for the House of Lords in Dingle and Turner from 1972 was whether a trust for the benefit and relief of poverty of particular employees should be treated in the same way as a trust for poor family members, and the court held that it could. Again, under the usual rule, a trust for the benefit of employees of a particular employer would be considered unreasonable and would prevent the purpose from benefiting a sufficient section of the public. But as regards to poverty purposes, the usual rule is amended and the restriction is permitted. Thirdly, to the members of a particular association and lastly, to the residents of a small geographical area. So this includes a small geographic location that is too narrowly defined in comparison to the purpose in question. OK, so this is in contrast again to the usual rule where this would not be permitted and would be deemed to be unreasonable. OK, so such restriction does not prevent the purpose satisfying the public aspect of the public benefit test. So distinguishing non-charitable private purposes. So as we saw in that previous slide, relief of poverty amongst a very limited class of people can be a charitable purpose. Most notably, a trust for the relief of poverty within a particular family is held charitable. But in order to be charitable, um, those that are to benefit must amount to a class or category. In other words, they, they must be identified by some sort of general description. This is because charitable trusts are trusts aimed at fulfilling particular purposes and are not trusts for the benefit of specific named individuals. The latter types of trust is a private trust which cannot achieve charitable status. So charitable purposes aimed at relieving poverty among a restricted class must be distinguished from non-charitable purposes aimed at particular poor individuals. So to relieve poverty amongst my relatives would be charitable. This is a class or category to benefit from the purpose to relieve poverty. Whereas to relieve the poverty suffered by my son and daughter would not be charitable. Okay, This is aimed at a particular named individual, so is essentially a private trust and not a charitable trust. The distinction ensures that the benefits of a charitable status do not extend to private trusts. Okay. So why is the poverty rule more liberal than the usual rule? It may be that the law's approach to poverty purposes is best understood not as an amendment to the usual rule on what constitutes a section of the public, but rather as an acknowledgement that such purposes benefit the public in general. So any purpose relieving or preventing poverty lifts the burden of providing such relief from the state who would otherwise have to act, 
This in turn reduces taxes to the benefit of all taxpayers, and in this way, the benefit extends to the taxpaying public. So it indirectly delivers a benefit to the entire taxpaying public. Okay? On this account, poverty purposes, like religious purposes, do not engage the rules on what constitute a section of the public. So poverty purposes are like religious purposes. Um, their benefit extends to the public in general, and so because of this, they don't have to engage at all with the rules as to what constitutes a section of the public. So second of all, we've got education. So some restrictions on opportunity to benefit permissible. Now, the usual rule is again amended with regards to the purpose of education, but in a different way to that where the purpose is to do with poverty. Now, where the purpose in question is to advance education, the opportunity to benefit can be unreasonably restricted in some ways, but not in others. So with respect to educational purposes, some restrictions on the opportunity to benefit are permissible, where others are not. The opportunity to benefit may be restricted by locality, parental occupation or religion. So case law tells us that you can restrict the opportunity to benefit by reference to these three things. The opportunity to benefit may not be restricted by reference to a personal nexus, in other words, to the members of a particular family or to the employees of a particular employer. So the opportunity to benefit from an educational purpose cannot be restricted to individual family members or the employees of a particular employer. We know, of course, that where the purpose is the prevention or relief of poverty, this kind of personal nexus is accepted. So what we have here is a slightly mixed picture. Okay, Some unreasonable restrictions will prevent the educational purpose extending to a sufficient section of the public and thus will prevent the public aspect from being satisfied. While other restrictions will not despite the fact they are unreasonable and under the usual rule would prevent the purpose from extending to a sufficient section of the public. So let's have a look at a little case here called Oppenheim and Tobacco Securities Trust from 1951. The income of a trust fund was to be used to educate the children of employees and former employees of BAT Co Limited and its subsidiary and allied companies. So this was the purpose. The current employees of BAT numbered over 110,000, but as the opportunity to benefit was restricted by a personal nexus, the public aspect was not satisfied. Okay, So the number of people who could benefit was huge, but the public aspect was not satisfied because the opportunity to benefit was restricted by a personal nexus. Therefore, the employees were not a sufficient section of the public in the context of education, as we saw in the previous slide. So the purpose did not satisfy the public aspect of the public benefit test, so it was not a charitable purpose and the trust was not a charity. The court in this case noted um, the conclusion reached would have been different had the purpose been to educate children of those involved in the tobacco industry in a given town. Because restrictions as to locality and parental occupation are allowed in the context of education. Now, there has been some criticism, and Lord uh, McDermott dissented in Oppenheim, and he argued that sufficient section of the public should be a matter of degree to be determined by conducting a general survey of the circumstances and considerations regarded as relevant. So he doesn't like how some restrictions on the opportunity to benefit are permissible, where some others aren't, and suggests an alternative test, arguing that sufficient section of the public should be a matter of degree to be determined by conducting a general survey of the circumstances and considerations regarded as relevant. So whether purpose extends to a sufficient section of the public should be determined by the judge taking into account all relevant circumstances and considerations. On this test, he held the trust in Oppenheim to benefit a sufficient section of the public. This was in opposition to what the majority had held. The settlers have chosen to benefit a class which is, in fact, substantial in point of size and importance and have done so in a manner which, to my mind, manifests an intention to advance the interest of the class described as a class rather than as a collection or succession of particular individuals. The test he proposes 
uh, is probably not as vague as it seems. His judgment as a whole shows what he is ultimately interested in is whether the purpose benefits the public or whether it is aimed at a collection of private individuals. His proposed test represents a significant shift from the current position in respect of educational purposes and the public aspect. It seems, although he's not upfront about this, to boil down to a little more to an inquiry as to whether it is aimed at a class of persons or a group of private individuals. So this test taken to its logical conclusions seems to permit any restriction, whether reasonable or unreasonable, on the opportunity to benefit, provided that those that are able to benefit amount to public, uh, a public rather than a private class. In other words, they amount to a class rather than a collection uh, of individuals. So although in theory this test was only said in the context of educational purposes, the test could be generalised across the board and indeed this would align with circumstances um, where the context is that of poverty too. Okay, so that is the end of this video on the sufficient section of the public with respect to the Charities Act. And in the previous video, I talked about the usual rule with regards to sufficient section of the public. And in this video, I talked about how the position changes with respect to poverty and education. And in the next video, I'm going to start talking about another part of the legal definition, definition of charity, and that is about this exclusivity requirement. So do make sure you check that out. But if you have any questions at all about this video, then make sure you leave a comment below. If you enjoyed the video, then make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.